Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. And joining us again to talk about health care reform are Donna Smith. She's with the National Nurses United and the California Nurses Association. And Dr. Mandy Cohen, she's Executive Director of Doctors for America. And just to remind you, if you didn't see the first segment, which you really should before you watch the second segment, but just in case, we're having a conversation about health care reform. Both uh, my guests are for health care reform. And we're going to talk about how the heck did we get here? Because if you go back to when President Obama was elected, and not far from here, there were I don't know how many hundred thousand people cheering for change we can believe in. And it, w it wasn't so long ago. So what happened? <laughs> Well, that's a wonderful question. I'm betting they're asking themselves that sometimes, those who are looking at the political uh, falling out of the last year. What's interesting to me is they just didn't trust how much support there was for real significant change in this country. I think that they, you know, to, to President Obama's credit, he wanted to reach out to the other side of the aisle and have this great attitude of bipartisanship, but that's not what the American people elected when they elected him. They really wanted change, significant change. We had seen eight years of the status quo in this country and real problems for American families and workers and, and people trying to secure health care. And they really gave a mandate for big well, change. Well, is it possible that, that the, the, the person that didn't believe in change we can believe in was, was President Obama? I don't believe that, though. I, I you know, maybe, maybe I should be more cynical. And maybe uh, folks who watch this on the left will say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that Donna really has any belief that uh, President Obama has has a deeper vision for this country, but I want to believe that he does still. And I think most people still want to believe that he does. I think you get into the Washington mentality where you know you want to act with members of Congress like you're going to act in concert with them and get things done. And what he didn't what he didn't estimate well, I think what his team didn't estimate well for him is how much support he had from the American people for making really significant change in doing it relatively quickly. I think they launched into this, we're going to have everybody's input. They heard a little bit of clamoring from this Tea Party right wing, very right wing conservative, a little clamoring from those people. The, the mainstream media elevated that to a very large degree, over and above what the millions of Americans who wanted significant health care reform were saying. And all of a sudden, we have this move to really tamp down on what we're doing with health care reform, a real mistake. I, I don't understand some of the uh, lack, of the, the loss on the PR front. Uh, mm -hmm. My sister-in-law is a neuro, pediatric neurosurgeon in West Virginia. And she has a practice uh, where people are coming from the, you know, the hills of West Virginia and bringing their kids with brain tumors and other mm -hmm. kinds of problems. And she gets phone calls saying, um, I can't bring my kid for the appointment today because I can't fill up the gas tank. Mm -hmm. And when I can afford to put the gas, mm -hmm. I'll make another appointment. Mm -hmm. And she's quite sure these people are voting Republican. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when a she asks her, uh, talks about health care reform with yeah. them, they say, well, I don't want to lose Medicaid. And they're convinced they're going to lose Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you have the, yeah. the, the pulpit of the presidency yeah. and, you know, maybe you don't have Fox, but you got the rest of the media to, to talk through, how do they lose this propaganda yeah. war? No, we lost the message. I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, some say it's because reform doesn't fit nicely onto a bumper sticker. No <laughs> fits great onto a bumper sticker. Just say no. Um, but, but reform, it's complicated, and I get that. But it, it needed to be explained in, in simple terms and how, how this was going to be better for the American people in terms of regulating the insurance company, expanding and, and um, stabilizing Medicaid, so, um, and you know, an investment in public health, an investment in primary care. Uh, you know, and those simple things really got lost in the message, and it was just fear of change really took over. Um, and you know, it, I, I agree that the, the right got elevated. Um, well, you, hand, you hand the whole thing over to Senator Baucus. Hmm. Nobody knows what the heck <laughs> right. and the, thing, the, well, the, the legislation the, is. Right, and the, mes the, the message is totally... But doesn't that show a sort of lack of commitment? Like, why would you give, well, give your, most, your signature no. piece of legislation to Baucus? Well, <laughs> I mean, they, I, I, I appreciate I, uh, that, that, we, that we said bringing... Every, you want to hear all the ideas. You want this. We're changing. A, we're doing a very comprehensive piece of legislation. You want to hear all ideas. You want to bring everyone to the table. But then you need to, you know, move forward. If and and if this is going to be about politics and not about people, then you just need to move forward. And so I think, like polling has shown, that if people know what's in the bill, if you talk about the specifics, they like it. 
But when they hear the word healthcare reform, it's it's c taken on a negative. Well, one of the critiques that comes from Donna's crowd is that because they didn't come out with, well, first of all, Medicare for all is a bumper sticker. It's pretty easy to get your head around. Mm -hmm. But also in terms of cost cutting, you can really just show where Medicare for all cuts costs, cuts costs, because you look at the Canadian example and uh, European examples, how much cheaper the healthcare systems mm -hmm. are. That the, the, what, whatever was coming out of Bacchus and all these other committees, there was, it was so, one so complex and so many holes in it in terms of cost cutting that it was, you, you couldn't actually sell it. So I think while Medicare for all does fit on a bumper sticker, I think going a little bit beneath that, you know, Medicare does have its own problems. So you need to be fixing those problems too. So I don't, I don't think it's as simple as as just saying open up Medicare for everyone. So I think that there are significant challenges that we would have in the Medicare system. It's going to go broke in 2017 right now with the people who are in it. So I mean, we'd have to think very hard about, and, and some of the changes that are in the reform bill are thinking about changing Medicare in order to s s sustain its life uh, and, and, and change the way they, they pay doctors and do different sorts of pilot programs in order to change the delivery system. So y you, need, you need to think about, you know, improving Medicare in order to, before you can think about expanding it to all. And, but, and I, but I do agree that, you know, the president, the great communicator, ha you know, hasn't communicated. But I, I admire him for his leadership in taking this this challenge on. Um, it's been, you know, decades, and, and sometimes you try and you okay, fail. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you because yeah. we're not going to do any. He, get, he gets enough praise. All right, fair enough. Because the issue, the issue of Medicare and the yes. slogan Medicare for all yep. is not just a historical question that, it, you know, he could have, should have. Right. What do you do next? Both of you are telling me that this piece of legislation, you know, it's, 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 it's not perfect. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a starter house or you have to hold your nose to support it, but it's better than nothing. But both of you are saying it, the fight's just beginning. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to fight for? So Mandy's saying Medicare for all maybe isn't the thing to be fighting for now either. We don't agree. We agree Medicare for all is the thing to fight for and improve Medicare for all. We would agree with that. One of the reasons I think it's clear to, to know is that the, one of the reasons Medicare has some financial problems, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, the sickest and the oldest are in the pool right at the moment, in the Medicare pool. You know, in this country, people who are severely disabled and people who are over 65 are the ones who are getting Medicare. Those are also the groups that get the most costly health care. If we had everybody in the Medicare pool, that's, a, that's the same basis we base wanting to mandate private insurance is, is the large pool factor. The Another problem for Medicare, right, the one is the Medicare Advantage plans are cost 14% more than straight Medicare, and that's because a huge rip has to go to the private insurance companies. They have to make their profit out of these Medicare Advantage plans, and they essentially take a pure Medicare offering where people can choose their own providers okay. and create like a PPO. So yeah, anyway, we've where do we... We've heard a lot about this, but this debate where is do sort we of more go? primary. Because yeah, where we, do we want to go to Medicare, Medicare for all? For all means close down private insurance companies unless they're doing some kind of secondary insurance as you see in Canada. But in terms of being, you know, lifting the main load, that. okay, so, so, because I want to know whether you guys are going to be on the same page and what the next fight is about. Mm -hmm. And we're taking it to the states you want as everybody well. on board saying mm -hmm. Medicare for all. The nurses mm -hmm. also did an interesting study that they released last January about the economic impact of extending Medicare to everyone. And it would actually be a job, you know, people worry about, oh my gosh, we'd lose all these jobs in the private insurance industry. When in fact, if you study all the sectors that would be impacted by everybody in this country having access to health care in an equal way, there would be a net job creation of 2.6 okay, so million Mandy, jobs. Right. So Everyone gets on board with Medicare for All. Is the next step or not? Well, so I, I always think it goes so much deeper than who pays um, and, and how you pay and yeah. how you set up that delivery system. And I think that that's where our challenges lie ahead um, in, in changing the culture of medicine, in changing the delivery system, and, and go beyond. You know, there are advantages to, to administrative simplifications and things like that when you, when you simplify a system and have... Um, uh, w one entity that's paying, but it's so much more than that. And I think there are things in this reform bill right now um, that are going to change Medicare for the better, um, change some of the delivery systems for the better to, to set us on a road to make you know make our, our system better but there are other places in the world that have better health care systems that are more efficient less costly good outcomes like Sweden like Switzerland that work on a hybrid system where it's private and public so it, you know there's there it doesn't have to be all or 
all or nothing. Well, the, here. Uh, the Canadian system is pri more or less private delivery with with public insurance. Mm -hmm. So, they, in that sense, the Canadian mm -hmm. system is hybrid mm -hmm. too. But the the primary issue is: do you cut out private insurance companies or not? Because mm -hmm. this the Medicare for all mm -hmm. gang mm -hmm. are saying they're part of the problem and they're not going to be part of the solution. Do you agree with that? No, I think that we could do regulation. I want that that we haven't given a good good shot at at doing regulation um, in in the market right in, uh, what we have right now. And so I want to at least see. Let's let's see how how that goes before we think about a very complicated way of dismantling a system that's certainly very entrenched. Thinking about how will we dismantle that system and move to something else without having people have disruption in their coverage and a disruption of their relationship with their primary with their with their doctor. Um, you know, let's let's have this process move forward. And right. I think that's what's on the table right now. And I think that's why you know there is consensus that this is the place where we need to start. Man. Disruption. I, you know, I, I hear that, and I, I so respect what you're saying, Mandy. But, but we look back to how when Medicare was first implemented in this country for people 65 and over in the 1960s. Within one year, people, you know, and they had predicted all these calamities with how people would get signed up. Within one year, the people who were eligible for Medicare, 98 percent of them, were signed up within a year. There was very little disruption except in a good way of extending care. Uh, poverty in seniors dropped significantly after people had access to Medicare. So there's no reason to think that those things wouldn't be extended. There would be disruption for the private insurance industry, certainly. There would be disruption for people who have been used to that framework of trying to deliver, you know, deliver, think about most patients and the frustration of going through an insurance company as really the bureaucrat that comes between you and your doctor. It isn't anybody in the government and it isn't, it's people in the insurance well, industry. to put words in Mandy's mouth, <laughs> they might argue mm -hmm. it's already been shown this isn't feasible given the reality of American politics. So why doesn't everybody get on the board from, for stronger regulation? Because even if what you're saying is true, you can't get it now. We've proven a lot that, re that regulation doesn't work with the insurance industry for so far. The nurses released a study in California where the insurance industry self-reported their denial rates on claims and nothing really in this legislation really goes at that core issue, denial of insurance claims. You know, you can force an insurance company to say no pre-existing conditions. You can say that you're not going to have, uh, you're, you're going to have to cover everybody who comes to you for care. You can't rescind policies based later on, based on someone having an illness you don't want to cover. You can do those kinds of regulate. There is nothing that keeps them from denying care once somebody's already one of their customers. This is one of the major problems for patients in this country. And if you go to the point where you start to, to limit their medical loss ratio, which is what they call all of us, we're medical losses when we use, <laughs> when we use the private insurance industry. You know, we are, we are losses. If you limit the amount of medical loss you can have, they're going to make money. I promise you they're going to make money. Listen to Anthem Blue Cross this week. We've heard all about them wanting to raise rates 39% on in California in the individual insurance market, part of what resulted in President Obama going forward with this wanting to regulate what in, to help the states regulate insurance so increases. Well, I think you're, you're, you're missing one important piece of what's in the health reform legislation is the, um, a minimum standard of benefits. Right now there's a lot of junk insurance out there and, and one of the regulation is, is really setting a floor. Like you you can't, you need to have a minimum benefit package. And so I think that gets at a lot of, of, of the concern about denials of care and disruption of relationships. So I actually think it's going to improve the relationship between a doctor um, and, and the patient because there's going to be this floor set so that we know we have at least a minimum s uh, set of benefits. Not only that, but a huge investment in, in prevention like no other. And if anything that came out of the summit, there was great agreement that we need to do more in prevention in public health. Let's start start there. Like if, if you know if this all goes 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 away in the next several months, we best come back and be doing prevention and public health investment. Because there was certainly a hundred percent agreement all around the table, lots of heads bobbing, saying, yes, we need to do prevention, you know, we need to do public health, we need to do you know primary care. That's what we need to be doing. And so, you know, we though those are the things that I think are going to strengthen the relationship between doctors and patients. And you get that through the reforms that are on the table right now. Quick last word. 
We just worry so much. You know, we've seen this, this track record from the insurance industry. The nurses have watched it. The docs have watched it, too. You know, it's, their, their track record isn't good in, in allowing Americans at twice the cost of any other industrialized nation on the planet. At twice the cost, our health outcomes aren't very good. We're right in the middle of the Olympics right now, the Winter Olympics. And, and, and we often say, if this were the performance of the American Olympic team, we'd fire them all. You know, if you really looked and we were paying twice as much for our Olympic athletes and they were finishing 37th in the world, we would say, oh my gosh, fire them all. Let's well, start this you, over you again. You might say the same thing for <laughs> the people that led health care reform in this town. This is a really... This is this not a gold medal performance Well, and here, right? I have to say, you know, when I look at minimum standards, I just want to address that a little bit. As a patient, I'm going to take myself out of the role as working for the nurses. I'm one of those people who had health insurance, a health care savings account, and AFLAC disability insurance, and I still ended up bankrupt because of my cancer and my husband's heart disease. And when I look at the minimum standards here, it's still not going to prevent families like mine. You know, when you talk about, you, oh, you'll only have a maximum of an $11,000 out of pocket every year and I think my god do they seriously have such a disconnect with the American people that they don't know that eleven thousand dollars can force a family into bankruptcy that's what's going to continue to drive this discussion forward we're not done with health care reform even if they pass this no matter what they pass we can't be done the American folks are still going to be suffering and hurting right though what I think the important thing to take away from all of this is that while we have uh, you know differences in sort of the recipe to get where we're going you know we want to go and we want to make progress we want to take that step forward and and you know and I think you heard agreement that you know this is the first step forward um, and and so I think I'm glad that Donna was on the Hill tell, giving that message today. We are actually going to be doctors and nurses together on March 22nd, bringing that same message. You know, health reform needs to happen for our patients. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.